All right. Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming to this first out of the lab session featuring Jen Richardson interviewed by Sophie Trawalter um, tomorrow. So this is going to be a great session. Um, they're going to have a great conversation. And then if you want to come back tomorrow for kind of more um, out of the lab goodness, um, tomorrow's session here at 930 in the same place is going to be featuring James Jones and Claude Steele. So please consider coming to that as well. Um, on to it with Jen and Sophie. Thanks, guys. <laughs> well, does this work? Can you hear me? Great. That was humbling. Uh, okay. It is an honor and privilege. Is it on? You're all on. Move it higher. All right. Hold on. Here we go. All right. Um, it is an honor and privilege to introduce Jennifer Richardson today. It's also daunting for a couple of reasons. First, Jen is so accomplished, it's hard to know where to begin and what to include in a short introduction, but I'll try. Jen received her BS in psychology from Brown University and her MA and PhD in social psychology from Harvard University before joining the faculty at Dartmouth College and Northwestern University of now Yale, where she is the Philip R. Allen Professor of Psychology and the Director of the Social Perception and Communication Lab. For over 20 years, she's conducted research in the social psychology of cultural diversity, taking a deep and critical look at identity and how identity shapes and is shaped by intergroup relations. This work has been published in our top journals and has earned her many awards and recognitions, including the MacArthur Fellowship, also known as the Genius Grant. And everybody has one. <laughs> Great. There's more, uh, the Guggenheim Fellowship, the award for distinguished scientific early career contributions from APA, and my personal favorite, the Millennium Body Award for Excellence in Mentoring from SPSB. <laughs> yeah, we can find that. Another reason it's daunting to introduce Jen is because Jen is so humble. Um, in truth, she would rather I not even introduce her at all. When preparing for this session, she suggested I just skip this all together. <laughs> And when that wasn't feasible, she said, keep it short, which I'm trying to do. Um, it is notable, I think, that Jen describes herself to the world, at least on Twitter, in her understated way, very simply as a social psychologist whose happy place is the beach. And so I will leave it here and ask you to join me in welcoming Jennifer Richardson. <laughs> So much love, so much love in the room. Uh, okay, so let's start back. Before you were, Jen, the social psychologist, uh, what paths were you on? What did you pursue? What did you think you were going to pursue uh, in your life? Yeah, that's a great question. One, well, thanks for that short introduction. So short. <laughs> um, secondly, it's fantastic to be the opening act for James Jones and Claude Steele. Like, okay. <laughs> Definitely come back for that. Um, yeah, so I you know, didn't know that social psychology existed as a thing uh, when I was growing up. You know, my family, are, they're not academics. Um, so I was just a good student, really interested in science and math, um, went to college instead of trying to be a dancer. That's a whole different story. I studied ballet for like 13 years. And at some point was like, am I going to try to be a dancer or am I going to go to college? I decided I wanted to have some economic security. So I went to college <laughs> um, and, and I was just, just pick something. So I started doing pre-med because that was organized and structured, which is actually the anti, I went to Brown. And if anybody knows anything about Brown, it's not organized and structured. So I actually it made no sense for me to go there because I like organization and structure. So I found something that would just tell me what it costs to take. So I took those, it was fine. You know, sometime in there, I realized I don't like blood or sick people. So I was like, oh, <laughs> but you like saliva and bio? Not <laughs> especially, but you know. Better than blood and, and hospitals. And mm, sorry, those of you who are doctors, and thank you for all you do. <laughs> um, but it wasn't for me. And so I, you know, was looking for something while I was taking these classes. I actually started taking a lot of neuroscience classes, which I found fascinating. Um, and I think I took every single one that was available. Um, but at the same time, I was engaged in all of these extracurricular activities that had to do with identity and race and class, gender, 
racism, right? I mean, this, that was basically what I spent all my time doing if I were not dancing or doing these science classes. So at some point I found a class, actually taught in the ed school, not in the psychology department, which there's a whole story there, um, but it was called the psychology of race, class and gender. It was taught by a black woman named Fanny's Miller. That was my first college class with a black woman professor. Um, one of two, I took the entire time I was there. And it was the, you know, proverbial Oprah aha moment. Like, wait a minute, you can study this stuff that is in my extracurriculars curricularly. <laughs> That's a thing. And black people do this. <laughs> and um, I literally went up to her and said, okay, how do I become you? And she said, well, you can get your degree in counseling psych, clinical psych, or social psych, because people in these areas do this type of work. And counseling and clinical still sounded like sick people to me. Sorry. <laughs> so I was like, well, let me figure out what that social psych thing is. And shot in the dark, applied to some programs. I mean, I had done a good amount of research and stuff, just not in social psychology, because Brown didn't really have much of it um, at the time. And I got into exactly one program, the one I went to, <laughs> and here we are. So. That's awesome. <laughs> We're very lucky to have you on this path. Um, one of the things you've already mentioned is some really important people in your life who put you on this path. You've been really fortunate to have wonderful mentors. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell us a bit about them, what you've learned from them as a mentor, what you carry from them? Oh, that's a great question. Yes, I've had, a, I mean, a lot of wonderful mentors, both my formal mentors um, in undergrad, Fanny Smiller, uh, Ruth Coble, um, who's still at Brown, who took me into her lab and you know, basically just taught me all, actually all things reinforcement learning, which apparently is back in cachet again now. So <laughs> good for me. Um, <laughs> and um, certainly in graduate school, I had um, an incredible mentor, uh, Nalini Ambadi, who was my main um, supervisor really from year two throughout, but also Herb Pillman, who recently passed away, who was just an incredible um, human being. Um, and the, I think the best of social psychology, the concerned about uh, intergroup conflict and devoted his life to establishing the conditions for peace um, everywhere, but especially in the Middle East. Um, and just a reminder of that's the history, that's the foundation of our field. And we should not lose sight of that, even as we connect to all manner of other methods and um, and you know ways of learning about our world um so you know they were just incredible but you know i had you know you find mentorship everywhere and people had lots of different people have something to contribute and i got a lot from um the other faculty at harvard both in my department and outside uh, uh larry bobo uh who was who's at harvard now he was there when i was a grad student he left <laughs> in the middle um he was incredible and you know just i don't know i guess i think for me, I think everybody has something um, to teach you. My, my actual mentors, I guess, taught me to stay true to your purpose, um, no matter what, <laughs> even if it goes out of fashion uh, in the field. And, um, and you know, not only in particular, uh, really taught all of us, I think all of our students that, yes, you, who might doubt whether you belong in this field, have something contribute, something important to say, and the field needs you. You don't need the field. And that's just, um, you know, that's again, an incredible gift that I try to pass on to my students um, and try to encourage them to, to learn to hear and to honor their own voice. And I think that's the best of what mentorship is. Um, yeah. <laughs> um. You've also found incredible support um, and wisdom, I think, from your collaborators. You've had some really wonderful collaborators. Many of them are in this room. Um, how do you find your collaborators? What do you, what do you value in your collaborators? What differences um, do you look for in collaborators? Oh, wow. I, I mean, am I supposed to know the answers to these questions? <laughs> I mean, I would like to, to know for my <laughs> Do I find my collaborators or do they find me? Yeah. <laughs> like why do this alone when you could do it with other people like I just don't understand it. you know I I find um yeah no I mean I think I we find each other I guess I mean the obviously my initial collaboration with Nicole Shelton happened because her 
PhD advisor, Rob Sellers, met me, found out what I was doing. Obviously, he knew what she was doing. And we're both, you know, these sort of two Black girls trying to figure out this Ivy League thing. And he introduced us. And then we decided, okay, let's do it together instead of competing for the next 25, 30 years. And that was by, by far the best decision I made. And Nicole is now, we don't actually collaborate right now, but she's clearly my best friend um, in the field for sure. And one of my best friends in life. And that's just, again, a gift. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think the questions that at least motivate me and motivate so much of us are just too big for one person to sit around and think about by themselves and try to do by themselves. So, you know, trying, if you really are committed to solving the problems or finding the answers, I just, you know, maybe it's my lack of imagination, but I don't, you know, I, you have to find other people to work with. And, and I look for people um, that um, are deeply committed to the questions. Um, usually they bring some different perspective or skill set um, than I do, um, which is great because I learn from them, but also they see the question, the problem in a different way. And I, I learn from that. And we move from there. And, and, and the ones that work out are the ones that are fun. <laughs> the ones that don't work out, it happens too. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, yeah, I don't know. I think I, I'm sure I've said this to you before, Sophie. She's known me as long as anybody in the field, by the way. So, um, but I really like solving puzzles. And sometimes you need more than one person to solve a puzzle, right? It's just too big for one. And so having the opportunity to work with somebody else um, on on big questions, again, it's just, it's just more fun. Um, and if nothing else, you get somebody to like, fuss at about like the reviews and things you're not by yourself on that either so <laughs> so um you just mentioned nicole mm -hmm. um, your work with your collaborators mm -hmm. in so many ways has been paradigm shifting your early work with nicole centered the motivations experiences and outcomes of people of color during interracial interactions in a way that the literature hadn't before your work with maureen craig and michael kraus and others has put into perspective in almost, I would say, a prophetic way, current events from democratic backsliding to backlash against racial progress. Um, you're obviously inspired by the world around you and what's going on, but you have this real ability to take the mess and the chaos of the world and sort of distill it down to these manageable questions. Um, how do you do that? <laughs> I mean, don't we want to know that? Yes. We want to know that. Well, you have to buy my best-selling book now. <laughs> Or infomercial for nine ninety five. You too can no. Uh, yeah, I don't know, right? I mean, how do you do it? You do all the same things. <laughs> you know, I, I mean, we all do that, right? That is the beauty of our field, right? That's exactly what you know. Social psychology is designed to do. We see something that's happening in the world or we have these questions about what's you know what's motivating me or people like me or you know maybe people very different from me doing what they do we understand that their you know in view of the world must be different of mine so you kind of try to like capture that and then we try to bottle it right bring in the lab often uh and you know figure out what the levers are right that's that's all we do. Um, and so, yeah, how do you break it down? I, I mean, I, yeah, I don't know. I mean, you should ask students. I don't know. How do I do it? I think I, think I say no to a lot of three way interaction studies. I think <laughs> I mean, it really just, I think a lot of it is saying no. It's like, no, no, no. We, it's really, we have to break it down. Like, we have to, to, um, drill down as much as we can, at least some of the time, while also recognizing the larger complexity um, that exists. So I really, I mean, I try to do both, I guess. Um, um, but some of it is, I mean, some of these, those problems, especially the shifting demographics one, you know, that really, <laughs> for Maureen, I think when we started that, I was like, okay, let's just do a couple studies and send it to the <laughs> census people and be like, stop putting out those reports. And now like 12 years later, we're still doing it. <laughs> um, and so it's become like a bit of a franchise, but that's usually not what we're trying to do, right? I mean, that's usually not what I'm I'm trying to do, actually. It's, it's really often, um, just you know, tr trying to shed whatever light on the topic that we can, that from the skills that we have, really, because you know, I mean, honest, I mean, honestly, 
simple studies, this, although they're much maligned these days, are really lovely, <laughs> right? I mean, you know, say what you will, but the Milgram stuff, right? It's like one number, what, I don't remember what it was, but whatever it was, like 67% or whatever it is, right? Like that is compelling, you know, in a way that is easily, it's easy to communicate to people outside of our field. And it's, and of course, easy to communicate why it matters. Is that the whole story? No. Do we have to be humble in the claims we make? Of course, do we need to be rigorous um, and sure, not sure, as sure as you can be, um, that what you're finding is, is robust and understand the constraints of what it is? Absolutely. But the more time I spend around um, people in the physical and natural sciences and tech, and of course, people in the policy world, they're looking for us to um, help bring to light these the human behavior that's relevant in the world right now. And some of that, um, we have a lot to say about it. Um, and we're either not talking at all <laughs> because we think we have nothing to say or what we're saying is so complex complex and confusing that it's not helpful. Mm -hmm. So, you know. Yeah. Um, one of the things I admire so much about your work is that um, it's often multidisciplinary, but even when it's not, you're really thoughtful about thinking about a phenomenon at multi multiple levels of analysis. And one of the best pieces of advice you ever gave me in grad school, and you gave a lot of advice, <laughs> we'll get back to that. Uh, but um, one of the best pieces of advice that you gave me was if you really want to understand something, you want to think of it a level up and a level down. Mm -hmm. And that's really stuck with me. Um, what best advice have you received? That same advice, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's really good. <laughs> Good advice. Yeah, you know, I, I mean, it is good. I mean, I yeah, I didn't make that up. I I um, I got that from from someone else is important. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think uh, you know that probably is. But another version of that is you know to really um, once you you know so first step is learning the tricks of the trade of your discipline. So that's you know for grad students uh, in the in the room. Yes, you want to master them, um, but then you do want to zoom out um, and learn at least the perspectives of the, in our case, the adjacent social sciences, for sure. Um, what we do, a lot of what we do, um, at least in our lab, you can't really do it without understanding what's happening in political science, in sociology, um, in economics. And of course, really getting a, a, some clarity around what's plausible in terms of the cognitive component processes from uh, the level of, of mind and brain, right? And sort of having some sense of the constraints, um, if there are any, on the, your phenomenon or how it operates a, a level below. It's just useful in really kind of coming up with a credible model of, of the behavior. So I think that's, that's, that's probably it. I mean, I think we, the field has changed a lot in those times. So we spend a lot of time looking down the sort of mm -hmm. ladder. Um, and we, I think, have given up a little bit on looking up. And I think that's that's too bad because, you know, what we're doing is, of course, fundamentally embedded in a, a social historical context. And to be ignorant of that is to produce, potentially produce work that is um, harmful, actually, um, potentially, and, and certainly not clarifying. Um, I do return to your advice and to genisms just in, <laughs> in general uh, often. Um, I wanted to highlight one for this audience. Um, this quote was on a sticky note on your computer at Dartmouth in your office, and it was the only sticky note on your computer, and then you moved to Northwestern, and, um, and it showed up again. It was on your computer, <laughs> the only sticky note on your computer, and it read, um, excellence then is not an act, but a habit. And I never asked you what that meant to you, uh, but it meant something to me. Uh, as a researcher and now as a parent, I think about that a lot. Uh, what did it mean to you? What does it mean to you? And how is it reflected uh, in the work that you do? Yeah, okay, so fast forward, that thing fell off my computer at Yale. <laughs> yeah. I think it's a casualty of COVID. I'm like, yeah, we gotta let that go. Um, <laughs> So, um, you know, to me, it means, and it's still, and this is still true, you know, there's just not a, um, a quick way to really do anything and certainly not to do anything well. And I've, part of this is my upbringing, you know, Southern 
black women <laughs> have a thing, at least mine, <laughs> was very, um, you know, concerned about poise and presentation. <laughs> very much a excellence is something that you, we must embody. This is just, you know, a woman of a certain age, black women of a certain age certainly get this and from the South. Um, so that's part of it. Um, but also, you know, I think I hold myself to a really high standard of, um, of excellence in almost everything, probably to a fault a bit. Um, but I think the reminder then is it just doesn't show up, right? It's every day coming back, you know, trying again, because we all know there's lots of failure and obstacles and frustrations in this. And so the, the excellence, I guess, is to be found in the showing up giving your best, um, doing the work the best you can, and honoring everything that went into the work, including the participants, including the, you know, the, everybody. And, and, you know, whenever you are either presenting the work or whatever, trying to write it up, trying to bring that level of um, commitment and, and, and dedication to bear. And that's, that's where the excellence is, not in the awards, although they're nice. And yes, I won a lot of them, um, but that's not, that's that's on the other side, right? That's neither here nor there. The, 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 what we should be doing is bringing our excellence, whatever that is, you know, to us each and every day and, and putting that into the work. Yeah. Um, so you show up every day and you show up a lot uh, and you work a lot. Um, your work is an attempt Right, to help us move towards racial justice. Um, but as an academic, you are we are all a part uh, of a system that historically has maintained and even amplified racial disparities. So your work, and not just your research, but your teaching and your service and your engagement um, are attempts to change the system from within the system. And that's, I guess my question is, how is that working for you? And I don't mean that, I don't, and I don't mean it, I mean it in such a sincere way, y'all. Uh, I mean it in such a sincere and not facetious way. I mean, like, how have you found opportunities uh, to change the system from within it? And what does that look like? You know, when we try to change the system from within it rather than from outside of it, what does that look like? Yeah, no, it's a great question. And I, I, you know, never expected to be in this position. Yeah, I mean, I went to grad school, right? I told y'all I got into one, I went. I made the best of it. <laughs> I got an academic job. The best of Harvard. I went. Harvard. Yeah. I, yeah. Well, I mean, you know, it was rough. <laughs> it, it, it was a little rough. Um, and, but I, although I was going to work really hard and try my best to get tenure, I didn't know that was going to work out. It wasn't, again, if people think it's like this nice little, oh, and then you did this and yay. You know, no, I was stressed. <laughs> and, you know, yeah, right. You were there. You were there. And, and you know. Yeah, we were stressed because <laughs> you don't know. Um, and, but I was also clear that this is just one path to making a difference in the world. So if I had, I mean, I didn't want to go out the back door because I just told you my mama would have been upset, but she still would have loved me <laughs> and I would have gone back to Baltimore and I would have done something and probably worked at a nonprofit or something. So I recognized that this was not the only way to do um, to make change in the world. And maybe it's not in the best way. It's just one that I turned out to be relatively good at, right? So that's, that, you know, that helps. But also, you know, reflecting back, you know, change happens in different ways. So there is the work and I, I hope it makes change. We know it actually has had some influence on how, for instance, the census puts out reports about um, race. Of course, it's too late now. This whole narrative has taken over, but you know, you can only do your part. <laughs> so, um, but change is, you know, now me playing the role of Fadis Miller for some other young black girl who's never had a black professor, right? That's something that I do just by showing up at my job. Um, it's by, you know, creating opportunities in space for lots of people in this room um, as we try to diversify social psychology. It was, it did not look like this. I mean, so it, when I started, right? I mean, it just did not. Um, and, and change happens sometimes beyond a horizon that you can't see, right? So, you know, I'm very clear that I'm drinking from wells I did not dig. I'm enjoying shade from trees I did not plant. And I just hope against all odds that the 
you know, wells I'm digging and the trees I'm planting will be to benefit to someone else. And I might, and recognizing I might not see it. Yeah. Um, the work we do. Um... <laughs> It's a really beautiful metaphor. <laughs> was, yeah. um, the work you do is uh, thought provoking. It's also sometimes heartbreaking, gut wrenching, truth telling work. Um, and it's it's heavy. It's weighty. I imagine sometimes that weighs on you. Um, how do you find some sort of balance in your life? Where do you find joy, mean purpose? Obviously, the peace in your work and in your life. Yeah, I mean, joy is, is some of it is in the production of the very depressing work. <laughs> I mean, we do have a good time in lab. We have, to, you know, as I say, we take the work seriously, but not ourselves, right? And, and we really do enjoy ourselves. Um, uh, it's in, uh, you know, sometimes it's in some trash TV, like, you know, come on, like, we have to just go for the straight popcorn um, from time to time. You know, it's, you know, in family, it's in, you know, life beyond, right? Community. Uh, I mean, it's in all, in all the places, in art, in, you know, in literature, it's, it's in it's just, you know, yeah, it's in friendship, it's in community, right? It's, it's in all those places. And every now and then it's in academia too. <laughs> um, Finding joy and peace mm -hmm. for some of us has been harder during the pandemic. Um, it's been difficult, obviously, for different people and for different reasons. As academics, I mean, I think we're fortunate, relatively fortunate, that most of us in this room had some, you know, sense that we weren't going to be unemployed and we had the flexibility to take care of dependents. Um, but still, it made the work harder, obviously. Uh, and we know that's especially true for women and scholars of color. How? Did the pandemic, has the pandemic affected you? Has it changed you, the work you do, the way you do your work? Yeah, I don't, I don't, I, yeah, it's a great question. I don't know that we're far enough out to know yet how it might have changed me. I mean, it doesn't feel actually over yet for me. So whatever, so I'm still changed, I suppose. Um, yeah, you know, but I, I do think it's made me think more, if that was even possible, <laughs> um, about the urgency of addressing these truly appalling disparities in our world, right? I mean, just, it, it's no, it's no, I mean, all of the life expectancy gains uh, among racial minorities have, from the past many, many decades, were decimated. Um, by the, by uh, the pandemic, right? And that's after uh, the 2008 financial shock that decimated all the housing, um, home ownership gains. And so you're just like, you know, what are we even doing, right? <laughs> you know, I mean, it really just is just a, such a reminder that on the one hand, it's important to be careful um, and deliberative and to speak carefully um, about whatever it is we're doing. But then on the other hand, it's like, okay, some people don't have the time to weigh this out while we figure out how to fix whatever, you know, racism or, or particularly structural um, inequality. They just, they're not going to live long enough to see it. And that, I guess, I'm reminded of that a lot, um, you know, especially now that my parents are in their 80s and they went through Jim Crow and, you know, it's sort of, odd to see them try to sort out what's happening now um, and to make sense of it. But, but the pandemic was just another reminder that, you know, it these inequalities aren't just something on paper that we write about or read about or think about. They're like real. <laughs> and, um, and, and it is life or death. We sort of talk about, oh, what we're doing is not really life or death, you know, unlike X, other, Y, Z you know, type of scientist. It's like, well, it turns out, yeah, actually they are, it is. That's what's at stake. And so it, it reminded me of that even more, you know, clearly. Yeah, um, this is a great segue into the next question. Um, and I promise we'll get a little bit more hopeful to the end. <laughs> it's just, we're just going through that journey. Um, the pandemic, as you just mentioned, put a spotlight on racial inequalities. Um, brutal instances of police violence did too during this period uh, and before it. 
Um, I sometimes worry that social psychology hasn't done enough, hasn't asked the right questions, hasn't done the right studies, hasn't prioritized the right kind of work, rewarded the right kind of work to really understand, not just understand, so I think maybe sometimes we do a good job of understanding things, but to really actually help redress racial inequalities. And so uh, the question is, what do you think? Uh, but the, the question is, um, what has social psychology done right? What has it done well? Um, and what does it need to do better or do differently to really help not just understand, but actually redress racial inequalities? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, yeah, and so I'm gonna ask it, answer it in a way that is like not helpful at all. <laughs> Because yeah, I mean this is I mean I and I mean that I hope it'll be helpful, but I I, I mean it in a sense of part of me doesn't know what social psychology is, yeah, right? right? You know, there's SBSP, there's SAS, there's the social there's there's social psychologists working in any number of of you know units, let's just say in academia and outside. And so I don't know that social psychology can do anything. Um, but what I do know <laughs> is that we can do something, right? I mean, literally us. Um, and, and that includes uh, some things that SPSB as an organization has done, uh, APS has done, um, you know, and, and SAS and the journals, making what we know more publicly available, um, really encouraging people, but also giving them the training to speak more publicly about um, the work. I mean, I think, you know, and that some of that started, you know, long before whatever reckoning slash backlash, whatever's happening right now, right? I mean, for me, honestly, it was the um, acquittal of uh, uh, George Zimmerman for the, you know, murder of Trey mm -hmm. Martin. I had just come back from Israel. Maureen was on that trip <laughs> and I got off the plane and, and at O'Hare and, you know, completely disoriented. And then it was like on the monitor and I'm like, there's no place that's safe for brown people. And, you know, and um, I mean, it just all came sort of crashing in a little bit and honestly a crisis of confidence in the field, right, in social psychology. And because allegedly we know a lot about not only just race, racism or racial bias, but also motivations to be, you know, non-prejudice and egalitarianism. And we're watching the news and the narrative about what happened is so illiterate with respect to what we know. And how could that possibly be, right? And, you know, there are lots of reasons why this is hard, but certainly talking to each other, either in these conferences, in at colloquia and in journals is not gonna cut. It. And that's when I first decided to start doing some more public writing, you know, and it's scary. Yeah. And you get hate mail. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, um, but again, if we don't tell what we know, somebody's gonna tell what they may or may not even believe is true, but they are gonna tell it. <laughs> and lots of people are gonna believe them. And, and you see that we already see the results of that. So maybe we should try something else. So, so I think that's what we should be doing in terms of our scholarship. Obviously, these societies and to some variance in, uh, in success and academia more generally, you know, should be doing more directly to impact the inequalities in whatever spheres of influence we have. So in the society, in our colleges, in our towns that our colleges are in that are usually incredibly unequal compared to what's happening. That's, you know, that's also what we should be doing as citizens and members of those communities, not just as, as scholars. Great. And I... Um, as a scholar, you have done, I think many of us aspire to do, which is to be more public, more publicly engaged, more public facing. Um, you're certainly in the public eye now. I would I would call you a public intellectual. I know you wouldn't call yourself a public intellectual, but- Neither public nor an intellectual. <laughs> um, well, but hear me out. I mean, I think, and I'm not on Twitter, but I hear that you're a reason, a, a voice of reason on Twitter. Um, I know you write op-eds that have really moved people and, and shaped conversations. You've been appointed to President Biden's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology. You're working with groups, including One Small Step, on reducing um, intergroup conflict and ideological polarization. Um, why and how have you made or, or come across these opportunities to engage publicly? And, and when you're thinking about your public engagement, 
um, who are you trying to reach and what are you trying to change? Yeah, um, so, so <laughs> there are a couple answers depending on the outlet. So sometimes, um, so the one small step, which is very cool, very cute mm -hmm. little <laughs> project, um, there, uh, I'm actually trying to change me. I'm trying to remind myself why I do this work. <laughs> it's um, it's a nice collaboration with a, a nonprofit, StoryCorps. I don't know if those of you guys know StoryCorps from NPR. They're, they're um, the guy who started it, Dave Isay, is created this basically contact project where they're bringing people together across the political divide to have, you know, um, fast friends type conversations of sorts um, and to try to reduce the toxic polarization. And I'm, and we, uh, my lab and I have been collaborating with them to help them do that better. So part of that is, again, to reconnect myself with the, with the work because we know we get pulled in every direction. And sometimes you think that your actual job is writing tenure reviews and not doing other things. So, um, so, so that's part of it, but also again, we have skills that are cultivated that other people who are trying to do good, whatever that means, make change in the world, don't have, nor do they have the resources to staff up in data science or whatever it is, program evaluation. So this is also a way, again, to partner with nonprofits to help them do what they're trying to do better and more rigorously. And, and I think that's just important, right? To, to, to really be a, be a part of the change. Another way that we can be a part of change was little cost for us and incredible benefit to them. Um, so that's that. Obviously, um, I don't know what I'm doing on PCAST. <laughs> um, it really is an honor, of course, to serve the president um, in this way. Um, it's incredibly challenging if you ever, um, well, I don't know how to say this, but the social sciences um, are incredibly important and I never doubted that. And I not only am bolstered in my view of how important the social sciences are for everything that's happening in terms of policy, I'm even more convinced of the need to shout that <laughs> loudly because there are rooms that are um, up into this point, absent social scientists of any kind. Maybe there's an economist who sneaks in um, and um, they're making lots of decisions. They're diagnosing problems um, and coming up with recommendations without us. And, and I mean, not even without us, like, oh, we don't need them because we kind of know what they know. They don't know what we know. And they also don't know why it might be relevant. It's um, shocking. <laughs> Um, so, you know, yeah. Yeah, somehow, some way, in part because of all those awards and things you listed, they asked me to come in the room and I went in and I was like, well, okay. Um, and, but, you know, I'm, I'm in there and again, really, I have no wisdom. It's my mama. <laughs> my mama said, when you go in a room, <laughs> when, you, you know, especially if you get invited, but even if you did it, make sense to make sure to bring your whole self. Make sure to bring everything you are and everything you know, because that's what they need to hear and that's what they need to know. So I'm in there. <laughs> I feel very certain that you are. Um, so for those of us who want to be more engaged in this way, what role do you think social psychologists, and particularly I think more junior folks mm -hmm. who are you know, still finding sort of their way, um, what role can they play? Yeah, I, I mean, I think they're, they're, I mean, obviously part of it is, is you know, put your head down, do your work, <laughs> get it, get it, you know, get it, but get some clarity and um, confidence in its, you know, robustness and talk about it, right? I mean, and, and literally talk about it to other people who are not academics, but then, you know, Think about what, especially if it's motivated by some social problem, you know, maybe think about writing about it in that in that way. How does this help advance understanding of something that matters um, to you or in the world? And again, you know, it's not don't don't do it just to do it. <laughs> do it because you think it will change or not change, inform the conversation in some way that makes sense and that matters and maybe is crucial, especially if the conversation around what it is you're studying is just so off base 
um, to you. It, it feels off base or just missing something incredibly important. Well, if you know that and you feel that and you feel that, and I mean, at least for me, I felt it in my heart. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is appalling. You know, I mean, and those of you who watch a lot, I'm a sort of a bit of a news junkie, although I've, I've I guess I brought it down a little bit. Yeah, no, I had that, that's I've changed since COVID on that. I had to bring it down a little bit. But um, but you feel that, right? That like, what are even people talking about? This is like incredibly, incredibly ill-informed and whatever. Okay, well, inform it, right? You can do something about that and and you know, go. I mean, do it. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's easy to look at the news and feel uh, pessimistic. Uh, and it's easy to mm -hmm. feel the stress, but you once said to me, and it really stuck with me, this is where we get into a little bit more hopeful stuff, um, <laughs> that we can't afford to be pessimistic because pessimism will surely get us nowhere. Right. And it stuck with me because, well, because I was feeling pessimistic. And so it was a good check on why is this not a good orientation to the world if we hope to make change. Um, but it was also, it struck me because it feels like optimism um, can make you look naive. Mm -hmm. Uh, and in a place where we invest so much in our competence, right? It feels scary to feel optimistic sometimes. Um, maybe it's just me. Uh, that's cool. But uh, <laughs> looking ahead, um, how do we maintain, how do you maintain a sense of optimism and not blind optimism, like really, truly, deeply informed and earned optimism? How do we get there? Yeah, I don't. I'm not <laughs> optimistic. <laughs> Optimistic. I'm like, I mean, I think there's those aren't the only two choices, right? I reject the binary. <laughs> I reject it. <laughs> no, I mean, I think it's, I mean, the, yeah, pessimism, I mean, yes, does not get you there. But, uh, you know, blind optimism obviously doesn't, doesn't either though, right? I mean, there is a realism, <laughs> I guess, um, that is, you know, important because you need to see through clear eyes the world or at least your problems as they are. And then even if you might, I guess that's the thing, I guess it's in the, despite maybe a, some slight pessimism or despite a clarity of the challenges ahead, you still have to get up and fight the fight, right? I mean, there's no room for, I guess, defeatism is, is probably what, it's like, that's just not, okay, Okay, right. But I mean, look again, people are lives are at stake. <laughs> Their livelihoods are at stake. Us living in a society, especially now, living in a society that actually is small d democratic, while also diverse, uh, equitable, just is not going to happen if we don't step up and demand that it happens. Those of us for whom this is important. <laughs> Lots of people. Who believe that's not only not important but anathema to everything they want they're in the fight <laughs> they're standing up they're talking they're yelling they're shouting they're waving flags they're doing lots of stuff i just don't understand how the, the response to that <laughs> from academics but also citizens cannot be like oh <laughs> right like that's you know that's a lot right i mean it is a lot but okay what are we going to bring and so i guess you know, for me you know like i said it's not an option to be I guess wholly pessimistic. Um, it's not an option to not be in the search for answers, right? It's not. It's not an option to not be a part, trying to be a part of the solution, both personally, in you know my commitments politically and my commitments, and then as a scholar in my in my work. It's just not. I mean, it truly feels like an all hands on deck kind of moment um, to me, and so that means I need to bring all my hands. <laughs> Uh, so what's next for you in your fight? Oh, I'm gonna take a nap. <laughs> I heard that rest was revolutionary. So <laughs> I hear the thing. Yeah. <laughs> Honestly, I'm more of the more of the same. Like I have no like. I mean, I, I, one. So there are two answers. One, I don't know because, as you know, where the work goes is in part governed by what the has happening in the world and who is in the lab at the time. And that's like the, also this great thing, right? We've mm -hmm. always bring these new people um, in and we, you know, again, create new collaborations and, and design new studies. People, you know, you run into new people and they have um, interesting ideas. So, so in some ways, I don't know what's next. Um, 
besides some of the, the same work, but um, but I'm excited to find out. Well, thank you all so much for joining us this morning. I'm done for a little work.